Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name's Dave Marshall and this is episode 113 on PBS Eons with Callie Moore from the University of Montana. So if I'm sounding a little different in this introduction, it's because I am literally sat on an oil rig in the middle of the North Sea and I don't have access to any of my usual equipment with the exception of my laptop. Uh, I've been out here for four of the last five weeks, so I've had very little opportunity to record, but I did manage to grab this interview with Kelly during my week off. So don't worry, the quality in the actual interview is a lot better. So every year we try and discuss the more creative side of paleontology, whether that be paleo art, games, films, or in this case, YouTube. And as outreach projects go, there are very few that have had quite the success that PBS Eons have enjoyed over the last few years. If you've not yet seen their show, then I can't recommend it enough. And we've got some of their videos embedded on our website and links for you to follow. So please hit that subscribe button on their YouTube channel. And whilst you're there, you might as well subscribe to our channel too. Whilst we're on the creative side of things, we had another great art competition with the highest number of entries we've ever had. The quality of the artwork was again outstanding, and I just wanted to pass on a huge thanks to everyone who participated, and congratulations to all those who won prizes. All of this year's entries are on our website, and please consider entering next year when we run the competition again. And before we jump into this episode, I just want to remind you that the easiest way you can support the show is simply by leaving us reviews and sharing posts on social media. And so thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And... As is tradition, with absolutely everyone we get on, we want to know what your route into paleontology was. How did you, because uh, you're um, collections manager at the University of Montana, is that right? Yeah, that's my nine to five, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and my route to paleontology was kind of direct. My dad collected fossils when I was a kid. And so he had a small fossil collection from uh, in the States to the Midwest in Missouri, where he grew up. And so I always thought his fossil collection was way cooler than his arrowhead collection. I just, I thought that his arrowheads were so boring. I feel really bad about that now. But um, the fossils always intrigued me. And so I believe when I was in like second or third grade, I wrote a paper about how I was going to be a paleontologist when I grow up. And um, I stayed basically on that track until I got into college. And then for whatever reason, I didn't think that paleontology was like a real job, like people really did this for money. Um, And so I went into a secondary education program, I was going to be a high school biology teacher. Um, And then that required me to take a physical sciences course. And within the first week of that class, I was like, nope, this is my deal. This is my thing. These are my people. And I immediately switched programs and became a geosciences major minoring in paleontology. And I loved it. It was amazing. I excelled. I was at the top of my class for my degree and It was just a really wonderful time. And I actually applied for the collections manager position during my senior year of undergraduate. And so it was kind of a whirlwind because uh, the University of Montana asked me to come up for my in-person interview during my finals week of my undergraduate. So my very last finals week, I had to move all of my finals into the Thursday and Friday of finals week. And then from Monday to Wednesday interview in Missoula, Montana, it was, it was insane. It was insane. I can't believe my stress levels didn't just crush me (laughs) right then and there. Um, But I ended up getting the job. And so let's see, that would have been, I was offered the job in mid-December and I had to be in Missoula, Montana by mid-January of 2008. So it was pretty quick turnaround to get there. But yeah, I feel like I've always really been in paleo. My heart's always been in geology, rocks, minerals, and fossils. 
Wow, st- straight into a job. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I can't believe it myself. I really can't believe that I got a job right out of college in my field. Like I'm putting my degree to good use. So I'm very lucky. I feel very lucky. I worked so many years in Pizza Hut. <laughs> oh. Oh, that doesn't. I've worked a lot of odd jobs too. I've worked in liquor stores and tobacco shops and delis and retail. And I mean, I did a lot of jobs in undergraduate before I got this one. And even when I moved to Montana, I mean, wages aren't very high up here. And so it was still a slow go when I first moved up here. And I actually started um, serving beer for uh, a, a company that does like big events. And so I, I had a second job for a very long time while I worked up here until eons came around. And then I was like, hey, I don't need to serve beer anymore. This is wonderful. <laughs> oh, wow. So before, yeah, before eons, you were serving up beer as well as being a collections manager. That's <laughs> Yeah, so during 9 to 5, I would be on campus, and then in the evenings and on the weekends, I would be serving beer at weddings or big events in town or fairs or whatever. Mm-hmm. Wow. And it, and was I guess that must have been a pretty cool story to tell. <laughs> like, when you're serving up a beer, just like, yeah, I'm collections manager at the uh, university as well, dealing you know, with all your dinosaurs. It never really came up. Uh, most people were just like, Give me my beer. Give me a beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Anyway, so back on to fossils. fossils. Right. Um, which kind of fossils would... Do you have a specialization or certain uh, groups that you gravitate towards? You know... Or is it just everything? Yeah, I... So... In paleo, there's kind of two different ways you can go um, with collections management in particular. Uh, When you work for a really large institution, like let's say the Smithsonian, they have their collection very, very organized and broken down by the type of organism. So they have a vertebrate paleontology collection, an invertebrate paleontology collection. And then within there, they're even broken down farther into subgroups. So you could have the brachiopod collection or the um, echinoderm uh, collection. And so a lot of times in these bigger institutions, you can actually just be, I am the collections manager of brachiopods. Um, But at smaller collections where you don't have that type of institutional organization and the funding and things like that, you basically just have one big collection with everything in it. And that's what I manage. So my background coming from Kansas and the Midwest is kind of... um, Mississippian Carboniferous into Permian a little bit uh, invertebrates. So mostly shells, crinoids, that sort of thing. So that's what my undergraduate thesis was in. Um, So I'm very comfortable with brachiopods and bivalves and echinoderms and things like that. But I also have a a lot of experience with the vertebrate side. So during my undergraduate, I was able to come up here to Montana two or three summers in a row and work out in eastern Montana in the dinosaur beds. So I had a kind of a broad background. Now, in my collection, there are things that I don't 100% know about, but luckily there's this thing called Google Scholar, and I can get all the information I need about anything that I touch in my collection, basically. So I kind of think of myself as like a jack of all trades, master of none type of thing, because I know a ton about a whole bunch of things. You know, I know a little bit about a lot of stuff. Um, so for me, I prefer it that way. I think I would get very bored if I had one collection of one thing, but I'm also not specialized academically either. Uh, so I think that I play to my strengths by being in charge of this massive collection that spans two and a half billion years and has everything from microfossils to dinosaurs. I think it's a really important thing to recognize that that is actually a skill as well, because a lot of people would just think, what are you an expert in? Where do you lead the field? In in which group do you specialize? But being across everything, that's that's just as important as well, I think. Oh, yeah. And I mean, there are, I'm sure there are more small collections than there are large collections out there. So it's very, very hard. And you do, you have to be an expert in that field on that organism to get one of those very specific types of collections management positions or curatorships. And um, for a smaller museum, maybe you don't have that kind of 
specialization, but you have a grasp of all of life history. I have learned so much on the job. I've been at the University of Montana over 10 years now. And so um, I know my collection very well at this point. But when I first started, I, you know, I was just kind of feeling around in the dark. I didn't even know what we all had. We didn't have an online database. We didn't have anything. Um, so it's been kind of this you know, crawling uphill to kind of get the knowledge that I need to, to be able to answer a question quickly. If a researcher contacts me and they're like, Hey, do you have any, um, some weird rodent thing that lived in your neck of the woods 30 million years ago? And I can be like, Oh yeah, yep. I recognize that name. And yes, it comes from this formation and here's all the stuff that we have from it. And, and uh, is answering those kind of questions, what you would do in a normal day? I mean, if you've got to cover absolutely everything, then I'm guessing you must be answering so many different inquiries. Yeah. How's it, how's it all work for you? Yeah, for me, um, it just depends on the day. Sometimes, uh, here recently, as we've slowed down a little bit on request, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people working at museums anywhere in the world right now. So um, the specimen requests have definitely dropped to none at this point in time. But, you know, I get maybe one to two requests a month, but most of the time daily, I'm working with volunteers. So I have a very, very small group of volunteers. We're trying to get our full collection inventoried and curated into our online database. Um, I used to give tours. This is usually like like the peak of my tour season right now with all of the um, elementary schools around here are kind of winding down for the year. So they always want to do field trips, um, but I'm not accepting any tours right now because of the pandemic. Um, so that has actually taken a lot off my plate with just not doing any tours or going into the classrooms or anything like that. So my job varies drastically from, from day to day for sure. It's great that you can get um, kids in there sometimes, you know, does, does outreach play a large role in this job? And in in your job specifically, do you incorporate a lot of outreach, like more so than other people, perhaps? <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. I'm one of the few in my department, in the geosciences department, that does a lot of outreach. So I pull 99% of the outreach from our department. So I do a lot of outreach and I think it's really important. And, I, and I've and i always really enjoyed giving tours. I mean, you can tell from, well, not really from eons because I'm kind of in a weird performance mode, but you know, if you've interacted with me through these podcasts or um, webinars or anything like that, you can tell that I'm very enthusiastic and I love to talk about paleontology. And so the best way to do that is to have tours and go into the classroom. And I want I want to make an entire generation of geologists, you know, <laughs> like, I want more <laughs> geoscientists. I want more paleontologists. You know, there's so many questions that need to be answered and they can't be answered unless we have people studying them. Um, so I think that that's one of the most important parts of my job other than getting information online so researchers can study it. So those are kind of the two flip sides. I work with the future geologists and paleontologists and I work with the current paleontologists and geologists to facilitate their research. And I completely agree with you on the importance of that, but do your bosses, is the university understanding of the need for all this outreach? Do they encourage it or do they crack the whip and try and get you to catalog everything faster. oh no mm -mm. no they understand the importance of outreach too and you know not all amp academics are good at getting people to come to science um and there's a lot of professors and grad students that probably aren't comfortable being able to do the type of outreach that i do so having somebody in your department that is completely gung-ho and happy to do these outreach events um is really exciting for my department because that means they don't have to do it <laughs> so so i am a hundred percent supported um in trying to get more tours and going out and into the class rooms and things like that yeah they they definitely support the outreach okay and with outreach in mind uh this is an outreach focused episode so i want to know about this project that you're involved with pbs eons mm. so for anyone who's not 
um, seen it, and I'm guessing that's a very few people if they're all paleontology fans. Can you introduce us to what it actually is? Yeah, so PBS Eons is a YouTube channel that is to basically celebrate the history of life on Earth. Um, It started out as kind of an idea that was kicking around the Complexly uh, company for a while. And PBS had kind of had an idea about some kind of dinosaur show. And so when they approached Complexly about doing a dinosaur show, Blake, my co-host, and who is also um, kind of the content manager guy. Um, He does all sorts of things. I can't remember all of his titles within Complexly, but uh, he was like, well, I I see your dinosaurs and I raise you the history of life on Earth. (laughs) So PBS was luckily really excited about that. So yeah, so Eons likes to go into kind of big issue ideas within paleontology, like um, punctuated equilibrium or um, uh, convergent evolution, some of those kind of bigger topics and weave them into a narrative that is based on maybe an organism or a group of organisms. So we really like to have a storytelling aspect on it. We very rarely do episodes about a a creature because it's cool, you know, like, look at this. It's cool because it's cool. You know, we, we really want a story narrative for any of our episodes. Um, And so that actually kind of bogs us down every once in a while trying to be like, Oh, we really want to do an episode on this thing but what is the story you know we can't just talk about it because it's cool we need this story so we have this huge backlog of ideas of of episodes we'd love to do someday but we just have to find that right narrative yeah so if you love history of life if you love geology geosciences paleontology i guarantee you'll enjoy eons so you mentioned the uh, pbs and complexly so I know PBS, I think, are an American, North American broadcaster. Um, mm-hmm. Is that right? Who, and who are Complexly? So Complexly is a Missoula base. So I'm based in Missoula, Montana. And Complexly, the company, is also based in Missoula, Montana. And they are a production company. So they are the ones behind all the sci shows and Crash Course. Um, man, they have so many shows now. Um, the Nature League was one for a little while. And so they're a science-based company. Their motto is they want complex ideas to stay complex, you know, like just let it be complex and let's break it down. Um, And so they produce a ton of science education shows. And I think all of them are on YouTube. I don't think they've ventured outside of YouTube yet um, for anything, but yep. So uh, so Complexly produces Eons and PBS owns Eons and supports us. Right. Okay. And and how did you get involved? Um, it's kind of a f- funny story. Uh, kind of a funny story. Uh, I was doing an outreach event at one of the local children's museums and a producer from SciShow happened to be there at the same time. And she approached me after my event and was like, hey, you've got a really cool job. Would you want to be on uh, SciShow? What is it? SciShow Talk Show. Yeah, SciShow Talk Show where Hank Green interviews cool people with cool jobs. And I was like, great. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. And so I was on SciShow Talk Show. Oh, man, it's been a few years now. And uh, and it was like the longest SciShow Talk Show ever because I talk a lot and <laughs> they they usually cut out all of like the awkward silences and there were no awkward silences to cut out and so after that one I was approached again um and they were like hey you did a really good job would you want to come in for a screen test we have an idea for a new show and I was like okay so I came in I did a little screen test and they were like hey you actually did really good at that screen test do you want to come back for another one where we have like a bunch of people in the room giving you directions and I was, I was a little nervous but I was like sure let's do it again and it was after that second screen test they told me about um well it didn't have a name yet it was just kind of an idea of a show a channel that they would like to start and asked me if I would be interested in hosting of course I obviously was 
And then it was like radio silence for a year. I didn't hear back. Oh. <laughs> I got like little, maybe once or twice throughout that year, I got an email from Blake being like, hey, this is still in the works. We're still moving forward. Um, but no money yet, you know, so we can't start. And then all of a sudden, I think it was, um, it was March 2000. 17, I believe, is when I got the email from Blake that's like, we're funded, we start filming next week. Um, and so it was this huge, all of a sudden, it was like a rush to get uh, to get scripts, to get episodes filmed, to start figuring out what this was going to look like. And so it was really crazy. We, uh, we launched Eons um, unofficially at VidCon in June of 2017, I believe, and then officially a couple of days later on on YouTube. So it was kind of fun. <laughs> and your role is just solely as a host, or do you get involved with the uh, scripting or in the direction of the show at all? Yeah, so I do host. I mean, obviously I host, and then I do fact checking. So I fact check every single script that we have. It always comes to me first, and then I go through it basically line by line and make sure that what the writer is saying is really what the science is saying. Um, 90% of the time our writers are right on it every once in a while, like they mixed up a number here and there. These are some of these scripts are insane. They're like meta analyses. They could basically be published almost. And so they can take a very long time to fact check when they're that big of a subject. Um, like plate tectonics, for example, there's like 10,000 papers that have been written on plate tectonics. So mm -hmm. sometimes the the scripts are a little bit more intense than others. So I go through line by line, double checking. I'm a Google Scholar whiz. I can find any paper under the sun. And, um, and then what else do I do? Oh, yeah. So I write most of the the script for our social media posts. So I send that off to our social media coordinator and she does all the posting, but I write all the text and find images and things like that. Um, I'm part of our brainstorming team. I love to brainstorm. So I help brainstorm ideas for new episodes, for new projects. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff just kind of just waiting to take off. I'm so excited. Um, what else do I do? Fact check, social media, brainstorming. And I do a lot of these. I do lots of podcasts and talk about eons with webinars and things like that. So yeah, I, I feel like I'm pretty, pretty involved with eons, which I'm very happy about. I would be sad if I was just hosting. <laughs> so as a presenter, are you required to go into a specific like central recording studio or are you filming from home how how does it work yeah we i go into the complexly studio so uh here in missoula complexly has a whole building it's actually the old funeral home in missoula that's been converted into a studio space so that's a lot of fun the bathrooms on the first floor are the old embalming room and it still has the old tile on the floor it's really pretty tile but it has kind of that kind of eerie feeling to it i guess <laughs> have you been in on your own at night oh no i don't think i've ever been there at night by myself i don't think i could handle it at least going down into the basement so um the third floor of the building is vidcon the first floor i guess second let's see let me try that again the second floor of the building is for VidCon. So all the planning and everything for all the VidCons around the world is done on the second level of this building. The first main level is the Great Hall. So there's a big meeting space. There's other smaller meeting rooms. Everybody's offices are on the, the first main floor. And then in the basement is where the magic happens. And that's, there are four video studios, I believe, and a podcast studio. So we have our own Eons studio and we film on uh, green screen. So it's super easy other than me not being able to wear anything with green, which is kind of a pain because if you've ever seen anything like clothing with dinosaurs on it, it's always green. <laughs> so I have a really hard time trying to find dinosaur clothes without green on it. But yeah, we shoot on a green screen and in a basement uh, studio, we usually have... 
We used to have two people in there with me. So one person behind the camera and one person script supervising. But now we have our script supervisor um, doing it remotely. So there's just two people in studio. We shoot 4K, which is was really intimidating when I first started, but we shoot vertically too. So the reason why we shoot, yeah, I know it's crazy. (laughs) The reason why we shoot vertically is so we can use the host's full body as a scale bar. So you can't do that if you're shooting just from like belly button up. So we shoot 4K and that of gives us the ability to zoom in on a host from like the belly button up and still have HD quality when we um, release the episode on YouTube. So all of the episodes themselves are HD, but we shoot in 4K. So a single episode when we send the raw footage to our post-production team is like 45 gigs or something. It's insane insane we actually had to work with google to figure out like our own server to be able to send this amount of gigs in a reasonable amount of time (laughs) it was pretty amazing uh what's what's the process of recording actually like yeah so uh we have a little teleprompter set up it's um an iPad with an, a teleprompter app on it. And it, sh- it reflects into a piece of glass that's in front of the lens. So I'm actually reading off of a teleprompter, but I'm looking straight into the lens. And then we've got a t- ton of lights. The room heats up. It is just awfully hot in the, um, in the recording studio by the time we get done in there. Um, yeah. And so I'm pretty good with reading on a scroll. So you just kind of find my cadence and then push play and then it just rolls and I just talk. Um, and then Nick, our producer gives me directions here and there. Oh, say it like this, no more like this, or you tripped over here. I have a really big problem, um, making plurals singular and singulars plural for whatever reason. It's amazing all these things you don't know about yourself until you have to read them in front of people who are making sure you're saying what you should be saying. Mm -hmm. So it takes actually kind of a while. So our episodes range in between, oh, I don't know, 10 to 13 minutes at the most, but it takes usually like an hour and a half to film it. That's not too bad. It's not too bad. It used to be much longer. So I'm getting faster. I'm getting better at reading. Um, We're also getting our script writers when they're new. It takes them kind of a little while to find that voice um, that kind of reflects the host voice. So a lot of times I'll go through before I read on camera and do a little tweaking to sentence structure to make it easier for me to say and have it more in my voice and my cadence. So it can it can take a while sometimes. Names are just the worst, actually. If mm-hmm. I ever get to name anything, it's going to be like Bob. <laughs> this is genus Bob. Yeah. <laughs> this species name Smith. You know, <laughs> I'm going to make it. It is easily per, like pronounce. Pre- I'm going to be. I'm going to make it as easy to pronounce as possible, and then. I will also put a pronunciation guide in the paper. I wish that was standard procedure for everything that you could possibly name in a paper is that you always have to put the the pronunciation guide with it because that would really, really help us a lot if people did that. So usually we get hung up on names the worst. So you have to read a line like 15 times to get it right. But um. The worst I would have to say was our like, it was like a feathered dinosaur script or the birds with teeth script. Oh my gosh, the names of the groups and the names <laughs> of the organisms were just soul crushing. I was just, it was the closest I've ever been to being like, I quit. I can't do this anymore. Oh, my brain is broken. So um, yeah, we try to figure out, we've, we've gotten really good at like, do we really need to say the species name? Is there only one species to this genus? Because if there is, we really don't need to say the species name or do we really need to say the species or the genus at all? Could we just show it on screen and just say, and this guy or, and one of them, you know, so we've, we've gotten better at making our scripts easier to read. In the beginning, everything was named, every group was named. And so we didn't rely as heavily on the visuals. 
So it can it can be a while for for the recording days. It is so hard. I honestly find it like so difficult to think on the fly and be able to articulate what I'm thinking in a in a way that makes sense or like like I'm doing right here I'm I'm just completely messing it up or if I've got <laughs> no. it scripted it has to be scripted uh in exactly the way that I would write and and I would pronounce it and oh god the the amount of work that goes into just writing a sentence for me to read out uh, I don't think people would get the amount of work and the amount of variability and how many things can go wrong in all of that it's so hard to do it's it's pretty extreme and then like i said when you have a script that's basically a meta analysis of everything that's been done on this group of organisms it gets it gets i mean Eons is a whole new beast for the Complexly company. They have never made a show so difficult to record, um, so difficult to do post-production. I mean, we're talking about animals that are in the tens of millions of years old sometimes, and they've never been reconstructed before. Most people have never even seen their names or spoken them out loud. And so a lot of what we're doing is kind of like the first time it's been done and it's it's really interesting to get to be that outlet like um gigantopithecus for example had never been reconstructed we couldn't find a reconstruction that we could use so we had to um hire a paleo artist to create this animal for our episode. So that was actually one of the hugest hurdles that we had to get over in the beginning is just finding images of these things, finding usable images of these things. Um, So that has gotten a little easier. We have paleo artists that work for us now. So anytime that we need something done, we just be like, hey, can you make this? And they usually do. And they have really great turnaround times too. So um everything has gotten easier. We're in our third season now. And so it's feeling much more um, fluid than it did at the beginning. And so you've filmed an episode. Uh, Do you see it again before it's released? And do you have any say in the edits or anything like that? Yeah. So I forgot to mention that when you were asking me what else I do for um, Eon. So I do get to see the draft of the episode before it comes out. So we had made a couple of tiny little human errors in a few of our earlier episodes. And so now I also fact check the images of every single episode (laughs) before it comes out. And so I literally go through and I find the source that our post-production team, Seth, well, it's mainly Seth, um, finds it. I find it. I double check it. I Google image reverse search it and make sure that it's like, if this is a rhesus monkey, it better be a rhesus monkey type of thing. And, um, And so I double check all of that. So I usually get to see the episode a couple of days before it's released just to double check that our figures look good, any animations make sense, we don't have grass in the Jurassic, that sort of thing. Are those mistakes still there? Some of our earlier episodes are still there. We usually just pin a comment and let people know like, oops, our bad, we're human, Um, you know, at this time stamp, there's an error type of thing. So we always come forward. We're very, very quick. Our commenters and our fans are also very quick to point out anything that we get incorrect. And so we really try to be upfront. So if there is a problem, um, we just pin a comment. So on YouTube, it's very, very hard. You can't make edits to an episode after it's already uploaded. And so that if we decided to pull an episode that would screw with our analytics and just be a nightmare. And so we usually just come up front with people and like, hey, we got a we got an error. Sorry. Luckily, that hasn't happened in a while now. So now that I'm double checking images and things like that, we usually don't have too many little tiny human errors like that. Well, science is a process, as everyone knows. So uh, say, for instance, you did an episode about Spinosaurus being the best terrestrial (laughs) predator, taking down T-Rex like in Jurassic Park, whatever it is. I don't watch the Jurassic Mm -hmm. Parks, they're awful. And now we've got this new one that's all aquatic and all of that. When would you say um, 
would there ever be a case where you say like, okay, the science has changed uh, so much or what we've recorded now doesn't reflect the latest science, it's time to take it down? Right. We have luckily not had any science change that drastically. Um, but we do have, we call it the Eon's curse, basically. <laughs> I mean, almost. It's had to do say, with you what, being in that spooky basement. No, well, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe this is our punishment from, for filming in a funeral home. I don't know. But it seems like every other episode we release, as soon as we release the episode within the month, new science comes out about that. I joke with my scientist friends and I'm like, hey, if you need something to come out, just have us make an episode about it. And then new stuff is going to come out almost immediately after. Um, so that happened with um, Supercontinents. It happened with Tolly Monster. It happened with Spinosaurus. But luckily, in most of our um, episodes, we always try to tell all the sides of the lines of thinking on these organisms, the 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 processes, etc. And so we try to cover all of that. So we say in the Spinosaurus episode, you know, it might be fully aquatic, it might be partially aquatic, it might be kind of terrestrial, you know, like we tried to talk about everything that all scientists think about Spinosaurus. So right now, our episode still isn't wrong but we don't have it illustrated correctly. You know, it still has the old theropod tail instead of the Spinosaurus tail, you know. So those things are kind of, uh, is it worth making a whole new episode about it or is it okay for now? You know, so most of our episodes are still okay. There's no massive problem with it. The other thing with science is just because a new study came out doesn't mean that that study is going to hold up to peer review. So we also don't want to be like yanking down our episodes before um, other scientists have a chance to kind of reevaluate that work. Um, you mentioned about YouTube and your analytics. So with most outreach projects, you'll probably be able to get I figure for how many people have turned up and engaged with you, but uh, with YouTube and being web-based, you can get an absolute ton of data. So as a person who's watching the show, you can see, I think, how many views, likes, comments, uh, but you've got access to more detail than that. So do you know who your audience actually is and also how they're watching the show? For sure. So we do get a little uh, a little bit of background from YouTube directly, from the YouTube analytics. And um, I just had Seth check that for me today so I could give you kind of the most up-to-date, like, kind of look at Eon. So if we look by countries, 46.7% um, are in the United States, which makes sense. Uh, that's where we're based. 7.7 um, .7 is the United Kingdom. 6.9 is Canada, 3.5 is Australia, and 2.6 is in India. Oh. Yeah. And I the India one was kind of shocking to me, too. And then as for kind of how it breaks down by age and gender, um, we skew very heavily male, 82.2% male, 17.7% female. And actually with science shows, that's pretty good. Um, most science shows skew very heavily male, sometimes 90% male. So having it only, only in the 80s is kind of good. Um, the bulk of our viewers age lies from 25 to 34 37.3% are right in that range 25 to 34 and then 18 to 24 year olds is about 26.1 and then 35 to 44 is 17.7 and then all the other ages are pretty pretty low which is kind of cool the 25 to 34 year old range because when we started eons we weren't exactly sure who our audience was going to be you know should we shoot for this 13 to 17 year old range should we shoot more for the upper high school um undergraduate range like where should we be shooting for so um uh, we're an older audience i guess now we get more data from 
the PBS annual survey. So each year, PBS sends out this huge survey, and we get a lot of information from that. And back in 2018, I pulled all the data from that um, to just kind of get an idea of, of where we were at. So it shows about the same as as uh, YouTube. So um, based on PBS annual survey, 74.5 percent are white, 10.6% uh, is Has Hispanic or Latino, 2.1% is Black or African American, 1.2% is Native American or American Indian, 11.3% uh, is Asian Pacific Islander, and 6.5% is other. Um, let's see... So the highest level of education, most people had were currently in college or university, so 23.8%, and then 27.3% had a bachelor's degree, 15.5% had a master's degree or professional degree, um, only 29 with a PhD, uh, let's see, 6.1 at an associate degree, and 15 0.06 at a high school or GED, and then currently in high school at 9.4. So a lot of our community is um, either has a bachelor's degree already out of college or probably still in college and upper level high school, which makes sense, I think. Yeah. Um, we also did a little community survey because we were curious how many teachers were using PBS in the classrooms and especially eons in the classroom. And so we asked um, our community and we got 9,426 responses and 146 of those were teachers, mostly in public schools. And 76, per, um, 76 of those teachers used PBS in the classroom. So that was really, really cool. Um, 334 were students, most of them in public school, but they were using PBS eons. So um, most of the teachers were in middle school and high school, 54% were in high school, and 67% were biology teachers. Um, no, excuse me, 50% were biology, 41% general sciences, and 27% physical sciences. So I mean, that that lines up <laughs> pretty good with what we are presenting. You know, I wouldn't expect somebody in a history class to be watching eons necessarily, but, but yeah, so that's kind of the, our basic breakdown of our viewers. Yeah. It's surprising uh, just how familiar some of those statistics sound. Um, we have not, a huge amount of information available as just the podcast. I mean, we can get download stats and locations and stuff. Uh, demographics are more, well, we can get sex and age really from uh, a proxy of social media. And again, it's um, male and fairly young. So it really surprised me because I thought we might get a, a lot more of an older audience but when i found out it was like 18 to 30 is 75 percent of our audience it was just like oh you guys are all cool and happening people of course <laughs> of course yeah you're automatically cool if you are watching and listening <laughs> to paleo stuff <laughs> for sure yeah you know and there's a big problem i mean that's like the million dollar question how to get more females interested in sciences how do you get your um gender to be more equal on your platform and that is like i said that's a million dollar question if you can figure out how um to get more female viewership that's like you've you figured it out you deserve a nobel peace prize or something um we've tried everything we thought oh having a female host would do it but um if you look at like physics girl for example her channel is also very heavily male skewed so um it's not just you need a female host it's something else and i don't know what that something else is is um but we're pretty happy where we are we would love to have a more diverse community but we're working for it we're, we're trying we're trying yeah our, our last episode was on diversity in mm -hmm. uh, paleontology and and taking a look at that and some of the issues of getting um basically non-white males 
interested <laughs> in the it's, field. And, it's and... really tough. It's really tough. And I'm shocked. I mean, I've been in the geosciences for a very long time now, and I've only had two non-white colleagues ever. Um, and I live in a, a very white place right now, so it's hard to to think about diversity when when you live in Montana. But um, it's it's incredible, and so I would love. I don't know how to do it, but um, I've got a little brainstorming group with some of my other paleo friends on on some way to increase diversity, just to to help the change. Because yeah, geosciences is, is the widest field out there. It's like 80 per, 86, almost 90% white people. And everybody interacts with rocks. Everybody does. Everywhere. You should we should have a whole diverse background of people working on rocks, minerals, and fossils, because everybody lives close to rocks, minerals, and fossils. So yeah, there's a disconnect there for sure. We're really putting the pale in paleontology. Eh? <laughs> yes. I can't remember who I stole that off, but yeah. It's anyway, <laughs> that leads on to the next thing that I was going to talk about. So um, as part of that last episode that we did, we got a huge, massive backlash, especially on YouTube. Uh, there was some pretty nasty stuff that people were saying on there, um, transphobic stuff. And yeah, people didn't really react. Well, a, a vocal minority didn't really react well to an episode on um, diversity. Uh and if you are in such a high profile position as you are with as many subscribers and views as you get, and YouTube is bonkers, really, <laughs> in terms of some of the stuff that people say. And so if you've got um, any issues with uh, that people might take against the science or if they uh, take a very religious uh, perspective. Um, do you get a lot of uh, backlash against the kind of content that you put out? When we first started, before we really had built a community on YouTube, yeah, our comment section was a cesspool. It was awful. Um, that's a, I mean, I've known always don't read the comments, but you can't help it when mm -hmm. you're the host. You know, you got to see what people are saying. And it was just awful it was soul crushingly awful how bad it was when we first started but now we have a banned words list we have um a really tight community that downvotes really ugly things so they get buried um and and so it's a much cleaner nicer place but yes we do get a lot of people coming on and being like yeah, this is all just a figment of your imagination god created the earth in six days or whatever it was and and so on those, it's just kind of like, thanks for the view, you know, like you're, <laughs> you're helping to increase the platform just by watching this. And so thanks, you know, like, uh, I don't know what else to say to them because I'm not here to change their mind, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of over that. I don't engage anymore. It's just if people have their minds set up, they're very rarely going to change them. It's the people that are on the fence that you want to engage with. And so I never go after any of the extremists that we get on our page ever. If somebody has a general interest in question and is asking it in a nice way, I will engage. But for the most part, I don't, I don't engage with trolls anymore. Um, but yeah, it, it gets a little bit on the evolution thing. And again, I'm just kind of like, thanks for the view. Like, you're not changing our our viewership at all. Our numbers keep going up, even though you're screaming at us with a Bible in your hand. So um, I think we're pretty safe from those guys. However, oh my gosh. Um, so we are owned by PBS. And whenever PBS does any type of promotional pushing, we are obligated to do that as well. And so it's Pride Month. And so we did a Pride Land promotion on our community tab, and we did a call out in an episode for it. Um, and these are just things that we we do, you know, it's, we're owned by PBS. And we got a lot of backlash, like, oh, our community tab was just 
gross and so much transphobia and just homophobia. It was just awful. I couldn't believe it. And um, our community, again, was kind of they were our warriors on the front type of thing and just down voting and and engaging with these people, you know, and it was like, you lost a viewer, you know, stick to fossils, blah, blah, <laughs> blah. Like, I come here for the fossils, not like the social justice and yada, yada, yada. Bye. And it was really funny because you had like 30 people were like, well, you just lost a subscriber. And within that week, we had already gained an under 100,000 subscribers. <laughs> so we like, yeah, it bye. didn't hurt us. Yeah, I know. We're just kind of like, bye. We didn't want you anyways. You know, like we don't want that type of a community. So we get it a little bit. Um, but like I said, luckily, our YouTube community is very positive and handles most of that for us. We also, like I said, have a banned words list. And so that also really helps uh, with some of the really negative comments that can come out of YouTube. So YouTube in itself is a really weird entity. Um, things that are popular tend to um, have a certain theme, you know, like top 10 extreme dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. The lists. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah i'm so glad that we've never done anything like that i was yep. tempted for a while we were but... tempted too but we're like no there's not a narrative we're not telling a story we're making a list so those automatically just got pushed away from eons yep but anyway um that kind of story more likely to be found more likely to be viewed views uh, ad revenue ad revenue pays the bills so how do you keep that balance between producing something that you know will have a story will be used in classrooms and uh producing something that would be incredibly popular you might still be able to get a message out through it but it's not as educationally um useful right so it's interesting. This question is very interesting because we actually just kind of looked at this internally. So we kind of categorized all of our episodes and then looked at the viewership on them. And it was actually kind of shocking because, uh, like, at least for me, nine times out of 10 episodes that I don't think are going to do very well, do the best. Episodes that I think that are going to perform really well, do okay. And so I, I'm still having problems grasping what is going to go viral, for example. Uh, we knew the cats video was going to go viral because cats, that's all you mm -hmm. need. You just need to have cats in the title and it's going to go viral. So Are you that, a cat yeah, person? I am a cat person. <laughs> I have a kitty. Yeah. He is hiding from the laundry <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so like some episodes we we know are going to do really well just because of subject matter. But on the flip side, I always assumed that our dinosaur episodes would do well because dinosaurs and there are mm -hmm. lowest performing episodes are dinosaurs. It's wow. like our, our community already knows about it. They're like, tell us something that we don't know. Um, our geology based episodes where it's not really based on an animal, like um, the time the Mediterranean disappeared or the carneal fluvial event. Those are some top viewing episodes and most of the time if we do anything about geology like the time a billion years disappeared those are always going to do really well our community really likes to see i think they it's easier for them to connect to like if you live in the united states many times you have gone to the grand canyon so you've seen it you've been there and then we did an episode about it and so you're like learning about this place that you've been or that you've seen and so i think it's a bit more tangible for people to understand even if we're throwing out numbers like 30 million years 60 million years a billion years they can still kind of focus on oh this is a place i know versus here is this animal you've never heard of we we don't know very much about it. We don't actually know how it fits into the story of life, but boom, here it is. Sometimes those, I think, create a disconnect. But the geology episodes do really, really well. Um, we specifically did kind of our three-part episode on geologic time, knowing that it would be used in the classroom. Um, so the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic episodes. Um, some of them we kind of anticipate people using 
And we are looking at trying to align some of our episodes, especially those types of episodes where we expect it to be used in a classroom, to align them more closely to um, learning standards so they could be better used in classrooms. So we're, we're starting to get there. We're having these uh, conversations with teachers and things like that to make it easier for them to use in the classroom. But yeah, right now, sometimes it's just a crapshoot like a uh, Megalodon, for example, who knew who knew that episode? It's approaching the most watched episode in Complexly's history. All it needs is 13, only 13 million views, and it'll be the most watched episode that Complexly has ever produced is Megalodon. Who knew? What What's it up to at the minute? Uh, I think it's up to 12 something. Let's look. Right. Uh, one million viewers. Uh, listeners, <laughs> go over, watch that episode. Help us we'll get, get there. get you over the line. But yeah, it'll be fun. Uh, we just found out about it. Our Seth, he does a lot of, yeah, it's at 12 million views right now. That's fantastic. So once it's at 13, yeah, we're tied with Crash Course at 12 right now for that episode. But like I said, once it gets to 13, we'll overtake the top spot. So we're so, so achingly close. But that one, actually, we got really lucky. We had no idea the Meg movie was coming out when we were working on that script. And we happened to release the episode, I think, the week after the movie came out. And so we got a ton of viewership. And YouTube was um, like pushing it all across the platform because the Meg was trending. And so it spiked like crazy. It was probably the fastest epi episode to a million views that we've ever had. It's the Jason Statham effect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's such a terrible movie. <laughs> but I've not it, seen it. Uh, it's, I love I the mean, faith, though. It's a monster movie. If you go into it thinking, okay, this is a monster movie. This isn't based on anything. But it's really funny. If you get into the comment section of that, it's basically just that movie. Like, we've only um, explored 6% of the ocean. Anything could be out there. Oh, my God. It was just an echo oh. chamber for that movie. And so it was really fun that we put definitely extinct in the title of that, <laughs> of that <laughs> one. But, yeah, so sometimes, sometimes – Episodes really take off, and sometimes they just kind of hang out at average. Yeah. Okay. Well, it does sound like you have a lot of fun doing this. Uh, is it the most fun out of all your outreach projects? It's something definitely very different. It is. It is by far my favorite thing. Um, I've actually had to stop working full time on campus because uh, I just have too much to do with eons now and i love it i i love having work to do on eons so um like after we get off of this uh call like i need to watch a draft episode check all those images and i got a new script to fact check for this friday so we've got a lot of stuff going on all the time and so i work 10 hours a week less than I used to so I can um, have more time during the day so I'm not literally working all day long um, going to campus and then coming home and working on my laptop for eons so that has released a little bit of pressure also um, PBS has allowed us to have a skip week in our third season so we're only uploading three weeks out of the month instead of four which gives us a ton of breathing room and we can put a little bit more money into individual episodes so we can have better animations better visuals um, it gives our post-production team a little bit more time to to make our episodes as beautiful as they are so yes i absolutely love eons i love working on it i kind of wish it was my full-time job <laughs> but i don't know what i would do without my collection i'm so like oh because i say my collection because i've been there long enough that i have i feel like i have ownership over it i'm in charge of it it's my responsibility and so um yeah it's kind of strange but yeah i really i really enjoy eons and what do you think the advantages and disadvantages of using video as an outreach format are? Yeah, so the advantages I feel those that's the easy one. Um it's easily you can get it anywhere, you know. Um if you got a laptop, if you got an internet connection, um you can get these episodes. You can download them and put them in a PowerPoint if you don't have internet. Um 
like at school or something like that. Your teacher could bring you in and show it to you. The disadvantages are kind of right there in those socioeconomic problems. Like what about if you don't have the internet at home? You know, what about if you don't have a cell phone that you could watch this on? Um, what about if you're in another country and you don't speak English or your English is not as well um, as a native speaker? You know, so these are kind of some roadblocks to get our information out there is just do people have access to the internet? Do they have access to YouTube? Um, can they understand it in their native language? And so we are working slowly, but we're working to get our episodes into more languages or at least in um, closed captioned in other languages. So every once in a while, we have people reach out from other countries asking if they could um, translate a certain episode that they need for whatever they're working on. And so we're usually very <laughs> understanding and very excited that they would like to do that and share it with us. Um, so we're trying to get our episodes into into more languages and making it easier to get. But I think that's definitely one disadvantage of being video only is that if you don't have internet and you don't have a cell phone, you can't watch eons. So the other thing is being on YouTube, a lot of schools don't allow YouTube in the classroom. So we're not on YouTube kids either, which is sometimes allowed in schools. Uh, so that can be a problem as well. If your school doesn't allow eons, it's very hard to show an eons episode in your classroom. So that's why aligning our episodes with more learning standards could help us get there um, to allow to have these schools allow a little bit more flexibility with a, like showing eons. So there there's definitely some roadblocks that we need to get over. But right now, it's the biggest platform that we have is video. And there's numerous other shows on YouTube, um, just off the top of my head, uh, maybe Trey the Explainer, Benji Thomas, uh, people doing similar sorts of things. Uh, and I'm sure there's absolute tons of other ones that I've not even seen yet. Um, and I'm sure many people listening would love to have their own show as well. Is there room for more voices on YouTube? Oh, yes. Um, always there's always more room for more voices on YouTube for sure oh my goodness yes and I always like to tell people that eons is a big thing like it's not me sitting in front of my phone with a ring light you know like there is an entire army of people that work on eons um, we have two sometimes three hosts we have a uh, a director a script supervisor we have a whole team of people that put this together we have a whole army of writers that write our scripts for us, you know, so there's at least 10 to 15 people involved with making one episode of Eons. So I just want people not to get discouraged if your episodes don't look like Eons. If you can't get that level of Eons, don't worry about it. It's because we have a huge team of people working on it. If you're flying solo, you can only do as well as you can, but be enthusiastic. Whatever you do, be enthusiastic. That is the number one thing that people tell me after outreach events is they're like, wow, your enthusiasm, I can feel it. It kept me energized. It kept me entertained. It kept me focused on what you're talking about because you were enthusiastic. So be enthusiastic. If you've got a friend that's really good at artwork, enlist them to do the artwork. If you've got a really good friend that loves to write, enlist them to do the writing for you. If you like to be in front of the camera, be in front of the camera. Um, don't let the production quality of Eons stop you because you are not limited by what Eons is limited in. We can't talk about an animal because they're cool, but you can, you know, we have to have a storyline um, to be able to make an episode, but you don't have to, you know, you could talk about famous paleontologists. You could talk about famous blunders in the field. You could talk about um, the few diverse members of the field. You know, you could talk about so many things um, with paleontology, geosciences, all of it, but um, just, you have to, you have to start, you know, like nobody will see it if you, if you don't do it. So um, start it. Do it and be enthusiastic are my biggest advice that I could give anybody wanting to be on YouTube. And finally, what's next for Eons? Has the show found its niche or is it going to keep evolving over time? 
I, th- I think we have found our niche for sure. Um, we found a very comfortable spot. The We're flowing very well. Uh, we're ahead of production most of the time. So we're feeling pretty good. But is that all from Eons? I don't think so. So we are working currently on a public podcast. So uh, this would be Eon by Eons, very similar to Eons, but it would be a podcast version of Eons. And so uh, it has been a challenge to figure out what that is going to be, what what kind of what it's going to look like, what is it going to sound like, but I think we're finally there. We're finally there. If you are a Eons fan, you've probably been like, yeah, you've been talking about this for a really long time. It takes time, you guys. It takes time. Um, but it's actually happening. It's going to happen. And we hope, hope among hopes that it will be like a first episode of that podcast will be available sometime in the fall. Fingers crossed. Everything goes well. Um, so we're kind of we're expanding into other platforms right now for sure. But the podcast is one of the main ones. Um, we'd love to do more field episodes, go on the road, um, do more interview episodes, even though unfortunately they're not very, uh, non. unfortunately none of our interview episodes were very highly watched, which is unfortunate because they're very cool episodes and we talk to really cool people. Um, so we would love to visit a dig site someday. Um, there's a ton of stuff that we would like to do once the pandemic is over. But um, but yeah, you Eons is not done yet. No, not at all. <laughs> okay, Callie. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. This was great. I always love to talk about eons and fossils. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone, with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So, if you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.